Okay, welcome everyone. So this is Basic Instincts, uh, our lecture. Hope I have all the uh, audio set up. I have the microphone closed because it's August and uh, I have the air conditioning on in the background. So let's get going. So first off, what is an instinct? An instinct is defined as an inherent inclination of a living organism towards a particular complex behavior. For example, oh, I need a pointer. For example, many animals shake when their fur is wet. Uh, many species of birds uh, fly south for the winter. Uh, why do they do this? Because it's an inherent, uh, inherent inclination. They just do it. Uh, and uh, it's up to us to, you know, that's the definition, but it's us to us, up to us, excuse me, to explain why. And that begs the question, since this is not a biology class, uh, do humans have instincts? And when we're talking about instincts with human beings, uh, we usually use the term human nature. And that's a concept that denotes some type of fundamental disposition, or a set of characteristics uh, that human beings are said to have naturally. Uh, and usually the idea of instincts denotes some type of essence of mankind or humankind, what it means to be human. So when we talk about human uh, instincts or human nature, we're talking about things that are inherent to humankind, uh, ways of thinking, feeling, behaving, uh, which make us human. And in psychology, we do not talk about human nature that much, but we do in, talk about evolutionary psychology. And in general, evolutionary psychology is thus we're taking the principles of evolutionary biology and applying them to psychology. Uh, and so you hopefully should have a good basic understanding of biological evolution. If not, you may want to stop uh, the uh, slideshow, stop, stop the video, and uh, you know refresh yourself on that. A brief five-minute refresher. Uh, but in evolutionary psychology, what we say is that uh, psychologicals are adaptions. No, that's wrong. Psychological behaviors are adaptions and uh, you know that's a hopefully a term that you remember from biological evolution uh, that is an adaption is a behavior which makes it more likely for you to survive in the environment and reproduce and pass those genes that cause that adaption on to future generations and these ada uh, adaptions are selected either by natural selection that is during our uh, struggle for survival uh, as an individual uh, or sexual selection uh, that is during our struggle to mate with another uh, member of our species which we uh, wish to mate with. So uh, psychological behaviors are adapted either through natural selection that is trying to get food, trying to stay safe and alive, or sexual selection, trying to get the partner that you really want. And, uh, you know, candidate behaviors for behaviors that are psychological adaptions, uh, we would see these behaviors in all cultures uh, because the natural selective and the sexual selective pressures would apply to all human beings regardless of your cultures and there would be behaviors but also cognition uh, cognitions and affects that is emotions so the best way to describe evolutionary psychology is to talk about its three defining principles the brain is a physical system that is there's nothing supernatural about the brain uh, the brain has neurons in it and these neurons uh, come about because because of our DNA, because of our genes, and so we inherit inherit uh, the genetic blueprint from our parents, 
and that blueprint determines how our body will be structured, including how our brain will be structured. Principle number two, our neuro circuits were designed by natural selection to solve problems that our ancestors faced during our species evolutionary history. So again, uh, our brains are physical systems. The neurons that we have, the way they're connected to each other, the way they cause behavior and cognitions. Uh, these all uh, are come from uh, natural selection or sexual selection. Uh, and uh, you know, these adaptations that we have solve problems that we have faced during our entire evolutionary history. And then finally, principle three, uh, different neural circuits. We often call these circuits modules, are specialized for solving different adaptive problems. So we have a uh, module per problem. Uh, another thing that you need to understand to really understand evolutionary psychology before we can get going is the idea of a fixed action pattern. A fixed action pattern is a motor program that is hardwired. And it involves a repertory of stereotype movements. That is, uh, you know, when a fixed action pattern begins, uh, there is a repertory that is a uh, set of standard behaviors that the animal does. The behaviors are characteristic of a species and their structural features and their evolutionary history. That is, uh, the fixed action patterns we see uh, usually are because of the animal having that type of reaction as an adaption to some type of problem that they face. And then finally, uh, these fixed action patterns begin because of the presence of a trigger or a sign stimulus or sign stimuli. Uh, that is, uh, you know, when the animal sees a certain stimulus, they will automatically uh, you know, begin that motor program, which is a repertoire or a, uh, you know, several different stereotype movements put together. So they see a sign stimulus and automatically, without thinking, uh, they uh, begin uh, the behavior. For example, uh, sticky back fish, when they see a red belly, that elicits a certain fixed action pattern for them. They attack because one of their predators has a red belly. And so uh, the sticky back doesn't really think about why I'm attacking or what I should do in this situation. When they see the red belly, they attack. There's no thinking, no conscious decision. It's just a natural response. Uh, let's talk about another uh, animal example of a fixed action pattern. Uh, here we have a turkey mom with some turkey chicks and this is a polecat, it's a type of weasel and the polecat loves to eat those baby chicks and so the turkey moms uh, need to, uh, you know, to be adapted to the environment need to protect their chip, uh, ch chips, their uh, chicks, chips, cheeps, uh, whatever. So. Uh, turkey mothers uh, have a fixed action pattern that when they hear their uh, babies che uh, cheeping, cheep, 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 like little uh, chickens or chicks, uh, they will come and they will start to nurse uh, and brood with the chicks and uh, protect them. The, uh, however, also the turkey mothers have another fixed action pattern, which is when they see the polecat that is this face here when they see that face, they attack immediately. And those are two different fixed action patterns. Again, the turkey mother is adapted to her uh, you know, environmental problems and evolutionary problems. Uh, she needs to make sure that her genes that are in her chicks get to the next generation. So therefore, when she uh, hears the chi uh, chicks cheeping because they're hungry, she goes and she nurses them and uh, broods with them. When she sees the image of their uh, major uh, predator, she attacks. So to illustrate 
the fact that animals are not really thinking about this and that it's really hardwired in that the sign stimulus causes uh, the fixed action pattern, evolutionary psychologists did a very interesting experiment. They took a chick, uh, a chick, a turkey mom, and uh, they put her in a, a you know lab, laboratory chamber, and they tossed in a stuffed polecat, that is a uh, you know plush polecat. Turkey mom saw it and immediately began to attack it. But then what they did is they started to play over a speaker the cheep 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 of the turkey chicks, and. You know, when it was soft, the mother would still attack the polecat, but the louder the volume got, after it got to a certain volume where the cheeping was really loud, the mother would stop attacking the polecat and begin to pretend to or act as if it was nurturing it and also brooding with it. And so this is just an example of how uh, in the laboratory, we can turn on and turn off these different fixed action patterns by overwhelming certain stimuli or providing other stimuli. When the mother was alone in the chamber with the stuffed polecat, the visual image of the face here caused it to attack, and again, no thinking about it, and then to demonstrate that there's no thought or decision-making involved, once the stimuli of the recording of the chip chips. The chicks calling for food got loud enough to overwhelm the stimuli of this face. The mother started nurturing and brooding with the uh, stuffed animal. And here's another uh, example of a sign stimulus which is kind of uh, humorous. That is a white thing with a red uh, head. Oh, it's another rooster. And so what's going on here is they're staring down this rooster who is staring at them, very aggressive. And you say, well, this is stupid. No, it's not stupid. This is a stimulus. And in fact, uh, what uh, ethiologists or that is uh, biologists who study animal behavior, what they've discovered is that you can play tricks on animals with their sign stimuli so that you can get behaviors more readily if you have a very, very broken down sign stimuli because what they assume is that recorded in the gene someplace or recorded in the neurons or stored in the neurons are the basic stereotypes of what the stimuli should look like or sound like. And the closer you are to that stereotype, the greater chance you have of eliciting a fixed action pattern. And a, one final set of animal uh, fixed action patterns, uh, kind of humorous uh, or sentimental for me. Uh, let's see, how do I start this? Uh, I've never done this before in a lecture. Help, uh, screen presenter, zoom in, slides, next, previous, last. Do I have to do this? Last view, screen, nope. Well, this is a, a problem. Ah, here we go, good. What's this dog doing? Is he playing? And what's this dog doing? Playing? And wouldn't you say that the dog looks like it's enjoying itself? It's having fun? And one final example. This dog seems to be 
be enjoying themselves. So what fixed action pattern is this, folks? Oh, hi. Uh, so this is a fixed action pattern when you are a dog or a wolf and you have a animal in your mouth. You need to make sure that the animal's not going to run away because you want to eat it. And if it runs away, you can't eat it. So if it's in your mouth, the simple thing is to break its neck. And you break its neck by shaking it around like that. And so we have the sign stimulus, which is an animal in your mouth, the sensation of an animal in your mouth. And then we have the fixed action pattern of shaking it. And another example of a fixed action pattern, obviously adaptive to the environment, uh, because you know, if you're an animal, if you're a wolf and you have prey in your mouth, uh, if it's alive, you have the risk of it running, getting loose and running off. But if it's broken, if you've broken its neck, it's not going to run any place. And so you can sit down and have dinner. So that's certainly adaptive. And this is not something a dog would want to eat, but I've had Border Collies before. So I know that they will probably chew this up at some point. Uh, but there's no nutritional value and it doesn't taste nice. So why are they doing it? Well, there's no why involved when you're thinking about, well, what is the dog thinking? Uh, the dog's not thinking. It's basically you have the sign stimulus and that causes the fixed action pattern. And in a module, in a you know, set of neurons, it's wired together that when you have something with four legs and a head in your mouth, you just shake and it doesn't you know the dog doesn't have to know about this the dog doesn't have to think this it just happens and uh, one final thing that I mentioned was it looks like the dog is certainly enjoying itself so just to review uh, we only have it when it's needed these fixed action patterns that is when you have the sign stimulus uh, that's when you have it so it only occurs when you need it and it just happens. There's no decision involved, no higher thinking. And I want to point out that probably it's rewarding to the animal. Uh, in some many cases, sign stim, uh, fixed action patterns are fun to do or somehow rewarding to do. And indeed, that's part of the fixed action pattern, the, the whole package of that mental module. Not only do you automatically go into this repertoire of stereotype behaviors, but you also feel enjoyment over doing them. So you're being reinforced uh, by your body, uh, by your neurons for doing this. Well, what about people? Do they have instincts? Uh, one of the most egregious things I heard a PhD in psychology tell me once is that human beings have no instincts. And boy, was that wrong. Uh, you know about some instincts already. Uh, that is, you've all taken probably uh, developmental, and so we know about these reflexes. Uh, the tonic neck refl uh, reflex, that is, uh, in certain cases, the child will hold their neck tight. The grasp reflex, the step reflex, and the crawl reflex. The, many of these reflexes only occur during certain points of the child's development like during the first, uh, let's see, uh, the step reflex shows up after about three months or so and goes until about 12 months. Uh, so they only occur at certain times uh, and then uh, they go away. Uh, the Moreau reflex uh, is when you lower a child quickly, that is as if you're dropping them, they will stick out their arms and legs and again if you think about it uh, the Moreau reflex again uh, this is a fixed action pattern in human beings and human babies so the sign stimulus well 
you should be able to think about this and this would be a great exam question. What's the sign stimulus for the Moreau reflex? And uh, you know, uh, what evolutionary or adaptive advantage would it have? And then just because I love saying the name Babinski, uh, the Babinski reflex, uh, it's when you stroke the toe or the foot of a baby, uh, they will push forward or push their toes down. This is kind of like, uh, you know, this is uh, to develop walking and it's a fixed action pattern to help a child start to learn how to walk. Uh, and again, this occurs and the step reflex occurs uh, because the baby just does it, but the step reflex and the Babinski reflex are both important in terms of helping a baby learn how to walk, which it gives them the start, but then the baby has to think and actually learn how to do it themselves. And then finally, and I'm going to spend some time on this, the rooting reflex, uh, that is when you touch a baby's cheek, uh, the baby will turn their heads towards the side of the cheek that was touched. And what's that about? Oh, I here are the my cheat sheets. Uh, Moreau reflex seven to nine months. Uh, the step re, uh, you know reflex or the Babinski uh, at birth to two to four months. Uh, and uh, the rooting reflex it's seen in utero uh, and it is uh, uh, present for three to four months then it just goes away and why does it do this the rooting reflex well uh, infants have reflexes which are fixed action patterns there's a stimulus and then a behavior set a fixed action pattern and how do they evolve well, the rooting reflex, uh, the children are born with a gene which expresses the behavior towards, turn towards a stimulus on the cheek. If they do that, if they have that gene that causes them to express that behavior, they're more likely to find the nipple and, help, and nurse. If they're more likely to find the nipple, then they're healthier because they're getting more food. If they don't have that gene, uh, it's going to take a lot more effort or a lot more luck to get the nipple in their mouth and get some milk. And so they're not going to be healthy. Uh, and they may die uh, in childhood because they're not getting enough nutrition. But if you have that gene, you're going to be healthier, you're going to be more likely to grow up and reproduce, and you're going to be more likely to pass that gene on to your children. And so then your children are going to be more likely to reproduce than those without that rooting gene. And that will continue on until that gene is prevalent in the entire population, which we see now. And some caveats or warnings. Uh, the gene for rooting is pro uh, will probably not appear all at once. That is, uh, you know, I said in the earlier slide, that there was a mutation uh, that causes uh, the gene to develop. That is true, but the gene doesn't mutate or the behavior doesn't come about through one gene mutation. Uh, that's what I mean by the gene for rooting will probably not appear all at once. Uh, you know, the genes develop towards uh, adaptive complete adaptive responses through successive approximations. That is through several uh, mutations and each mutation is one minor step towards uh, the final product that we see now. So uh, at some point and each step will be uh, rewarded evolutionarily that is each step uh, is going to make the child more likely to grow be more adaptive and grow up and be healthier and pass that uh, rudimentary gene for a rudimentary rooting response on to their children who then may have a mutation which will bring them a little bit closer to the rooting response we see now. And that whole process of little steps is called successive approximation. Each successive approximation is rewarded 
In this case, uh, it is adaptive. Each little step is adaptive. It makes it more likely that the organism is going to live and reproduce. Uh, and finally, in the end, it gets to what we see now as a rooting reflex or whatever. Uh, geese uh, migrating, another fixed action pattern, very complex behavior. So let's talk about some fixed action patterns or mental modules in human beings. And let's talk about big alien cats. Britain's bit wild big cats. So uh, Britain only has one native wildcat, and that's the Scottish wildcat, which is almost extinct. And Scottish wildcats are around the size of a small house cat. Uh, so in Britain, which is an island, uh, they only have uh, you know house cats and uh, uh, like 400 Scottish wildcats. So you can count those out. But people keep on saying in Britain that they see a giant cat, a giant wildcat. Uh, this is one of those people. Oh, there's my pointer. And he, uh, you know, believes that there are wildcats in Britain. And he has made a puma <laughs> uh, dummy as a educational uh, device for his cause. And as you can see here in the, uh, you know, heading, hundreds of big cat sightings have been reported in Britain in the last three years. Uh, but is it pumas and panthers running wild in our imagination? And the quote is, we're not a bunch of nutters, we're not crazy, but Rick here uh, is a big cat consultant with one of his props. He believes that, yes, there are these big cats running a wild. And we see from Britain, uh, you know, for more than 50 years, people have reported big cats. Uh, South Yorkshire is a hotbed for the sightings of big cats. And you know what happens in Britain is somebody calls up the p police and they say, I see a puma in my backyard. Or I see a tiger or something in my backyard. And they're like, oh, you know, the police are, are you sure? Yeah. And so the police send out a, a police car, which in Britain they call panda cars. And they investigate sometimes just because one person reported seeing a tiger or a panther or a, a puma or a cougar, uh, they send out lots of police and helicopters and everything. And all the searches pretty much find that there's nothing there. And in fact, all they get are some blurry photos of, is that a big house cat or is that maybe some type of badger? Uh, is that somebody's cat or moggy as they call it in Britain? Who knows? Why is this the case? Well, I think this and a lot of other people think this is a fixed action pattern. And here's why. Uh, Dino Fellis, that's this guy here, uh, was a cat that lived one to two million years ago. Uh, and he had a, a special interest in eating our ancestors. That's one of our ancestors there. Uh, some biologists call him a specialist killer of primates. That's us. And he was puma-sized with long teeth. Uh, and so, uh, you know, think back about a million and a half years ago. Uh, you are us, one of our ancestors, and you're walking around in the bush and uh, you see something off in the distance and you don't know what it is. If you have a mutation that makes you think it looks like a cat or makes you scared, uh, then you will stop and become cautious. You'll freeze and focus on it until you know that it's a safe thing or if you realize it's a a puma, you'll get the heck out of there, or a dinophilus, you'll get the he heck out of there. And uh, let's talk about some evidence from your life. How many of you were afraid of monsters when you were a little kid? Uh, uh, you know, when I'm in class, 
a lot of students talk about their fear of monsters and well when did these monsters usually show up or when w were you the most afraid of them when it was dark and where did they hang out uh, they hung out in your closet they hung out underneath your bed well it's not surprising that you have fears as a child about monsters who are uh, around when it's dark and who are hiding in a closet and hiding under your bed because if you have a house cat one thing you'll know is that this is how cats hunt that is cats will tend to and I'm talking about pumas dinophilus or your house cat they will usually hunt in uh, the twilight uh, that is dusk or dawn uh, so they're more active when it's uh, you know dusk or dawn they will want to tend to hide in things like boxes cardboard boxes or caves or cliff uh, faces they'll also want to hide underneath things like underneath hedges or underneath uh, you know uh, rock faces or anything like that hide and then jump out and surprise whatever they're hunting and it's very interesting that the things that you're afraid of as a child or the situations you're afraid of about the monsters that the monsters only show up when it's dark that is you're getting ready to go to bed it's twilight uh, the monsters are probably going to be underneath your bed if you stick your feet out on, on the floor they'll reach out from under the bed and uh, grab your ankles and uh, I've had cats do that because that's how cats like to hunt and my cats playing around would certainly do that uh, so it's very interesting that the things that these monsters do are the things that Dino Fellas would do when it would be hunting our ancestors and so again what I'm saying is this over well we had a couple million years for this to happen so over these couple of million years through successive approximations people would mutate a gene which would cause them to become more curious or more uh, fearful when they thought they saw the image the shape of a cat they would mutate a gene that would make them more cautious and fearful uh, when it's dark they would mutate a gene to be more concerned when they're around uh, openings like cave openings and this gene was adaptive because there were you know Dino Felices hiding in these places in the twilight ready to kill us and if you were a little bit more afraid of those things you were a little bit more likely to survive and you know pass that gene on to future generations if you were a little bit more likely to see a shape in the distance and say is that a cat oh my god uh, you were a little bit more likely to survive and pass that gene on to future generations and indeed just like uh, the rooting reflex it's only around uh, for a couple of months when we're children and then once we figure out what a nipple is for it goes away because we don't need it and likewise uh, if you've been afraid of the dark as a child you're probably no longer afraid of the dark as an adult probably by the time you're 15 you're no longer afraid of the dark and that's because again uh, you know this fixed action pattern was only uh, working in us during a specific time in our individual development it taught us to be afraid of the dark afraid of those monsters uh, and then once we got older uh, we had those fears we were cautious it served what uh, it needed to do and so it just went away uh, and so that's why we're no longer afraid of uh, the monsters in the uh, uh, you know as adults but sometimes we are aren't we and this is why we have the alien big cats in Britain because uh, even as adults we have 
the remnants of that fixed action pattern. That is, we all have been programmed during our childhood to see the image of cats in the distance when they may not be there. So again, great example of a fixed action pattern. There's an evolutionary explanation for it. Uh, and uh, we see how it shapes how we perceive things, how we feel about what we perceive, and how we behave. Uh, we think we see monsters in the dark, uh, and we think we see alien big cats, and it makes us afraid, and that fear causes us to avoid certain situations. Oh, another one. Here is Dino Fellas here. A 90 kilogram cat with big saber te te teeth. But of course, our ancestors had some smaller and larger problems for millions of years. So it's pretty clear that our ancestors had a lot of cat problems. And so remember, it's adaptive to see a big cat. There's no downside of a false alarm. You sit and you look around the environment for a couple of minutes and you realize, oh, I must have saw like a little badger. And then you move on, no big deal. Compare that to the opposite. You see a, a figure in the distance. You say, is that a cat? But you don't care and you keep on walking and then it kills you. Well, that is important. Uh, the general cat figure is a sign stimulus. The fear is the fixed action pattern. And were you afraid of the dark? And did monsters live under your bed? Well, of course they did. Now we know who that monster was underneath your bed. OK, another fixed action pattern in human beings. Uh, this is really interesting. Now, let's go back to developmental psych again. Uh, babies who are like six months or 10 months old, which uh, Piagetian stage are they in? And if you're thinking, you should answer the sensory motor period. That is, uh, you know, Piaget says during this period they just have a repertoire of stereotype behaviors and they're putting these behaviors together but there's no real thought or cognition. Okay, so there's no real thought in babies that young. If, there's, if it's true that there's no real thought, how could you explain this without the idea of a fixed action pattern? In an experiment, children, uh, as young as six months old, are brought into the lab and they're shown a little diorama where there's like a roller coaster type hills and you know different toys are trying to go up it. And one toy uh, is trying to climb up the hill but it's having a hard time. And in one condition of the experiment, another toy comes along and it either helps it over the mountain, it helps pushes it up, or it pushes past it and knocks it back down the mountain. So uh, babies as young as six months saw this little uh, demonstration in the lab. Then a few minutes later they were allowed to play with toys and one of the toys was the googly-eyed monster that either helped or hurt the other monster or the other toy. And nearly every baby picked the helpful toy over the bad one. Now, how is that occurring? Uh, babies are not able to think and create categories uh, according to Piaget. They're not able to develop schemas at that age. So how are they developing a schema and placing into it this toy when they're pre-schematic? Well, the answer is they're not developing schemas. This behavior and this ability to discriminate between the bad toy and the good toy is probably due to a fixed action pattern. That is, there's no thought involved. There's no decision making involved. The baby just likes the helpful toy more and they want to be with a helpful toy more than the hurtful toy. And if you think about it, you can imagine how that would be adaptive to a baby. 
next example and second to the last example, uh, the social psychologist Ellen Langer, uh, you know, did this experiment. She had uh, you know experimenters who were students walk up to the lines of students in a library waiting to use the Xerox machine. And I have to you know give you a little bit of history. Uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, we would have to we didn't have everything on the you know databases, so we'd have to look up things you know on in uh, books and journals and bound periodicals. And then we'd have to, if we wanted a copy of the article, we had to go to the Xerox machine and pay a nickel or a dime per page to make uh, Xerox. And so there was usually a line there in front of the Xerox machine. And so she had her subject experimenters go to the front of the line and say, excuse me, could I get in front of you? I need to make a copy because and, you know, in some uh, conditions, the experimenter said, because I'm in a rush, in other conditions, they didn't say because at all, said, excuse me, can I get in front of you? I need to make a copy. And then in another condition, they said, uh, could I get in front of you because I need to make some copies? So what she found was, first of all, uh, if there was no because, the compliance rate of the people in line was 60%. That is, uh, you know, 60% uh, of the people would say, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, however, if you said because for any reason, the compliance rate shot up to the middle 90s. And so, uh, for some reason, saying, giving a because, giving a reason for why you need to do something and asking a favor significantly helps in having that favor filled. Also, you have to notice that, well, the reason why you need to get in front of the line is you're in a rush. So this because certainly makes sense. However, I need to make copies, well, duh, this does not make sense. But notice that the compliance rate is pretty much the same. And Langer interprets this as saying that what's going on here is that uh, we have a fixed action pattern that assigns stimulus of when people ask for favors. If they give a reason, that causes us to be more positive towards their request and to be more likely to fill it. And so the sign stimulus is a request with a because and the fixed action pattern is feeling more positive about it and you know agreeing to do it. Uh, and probably the evolutionary uh, genesis of this is that if somebody asked you for help on something uh, and they did that in a way because they explained why they needed it or they talked about why it would be helpful that would indicate that the person uh, cares about you and your perspective and so that in the future they may redo you the favor because they care about you. No because means they don't care about you and so uh, they probably won't help you out in the future and so that's why you won't help them out that much now. All right and then Let's get going, folks. Our final fixed action pattern module, uh, the waste and task. And this one is truly amazing. And, uh, uh, you know, this is really very convincing, especially to me, that, yes, indeed, uh, you know, uh, we have these very complex fixed action patterns as human beings. So here is the waste and task. Uh, the rule is, if a card has a D on one side, then it has a 7 on the other. In order to check out whether the rule is true uh, of these cards, what's the least amount of cards you'll need to turn over, and which ones? So think about this for a minute. Stop the video if you want, and uh, you know answer the question. D on one side, 7 on the other. Which cards do you have to flip over, and 
uh, you know, choose the least amount of cards to prove this rule, uh, to flip over, which ones do you need to flip over? Okay, so if there is a D on one side and a 7 on the other, you will need to flip over two cards to prove that rule. Uh, here's why. Uh, the rule says D on one side, 7 on the other, so you have to flip this over. There has to be a 7 here. The rule says nothing about an F, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. The rule doesn't say anything about any other numbers, so as long as there are, uh, you know, there could be A, B, C, D, as long as there is, you know, uh, you know, any other number, uh, you know, it's okay to flip this over, you know, it's okay not to flip this over. And finally, you have to flip the 5 over because you have to make sure there is no D here. Because if there is a D here, it would disprove the rule. Now, this is a hypothetical, logical rule, and only 25% of people get this correct. And as you can see, as I was trying to explain it, I screwed up in explaining the 7, and uh, that's because this is a very hard, hypothetical, logical problem. However, uh, let's talk about a familiar social contract. Uh, let's say you make an agreement with your roommate. If Bob borrows my car, then he fills up the gas tank. That's the rule. So you want to check up to, uh, on whether Bob is living up to the agreement. Which situations do you need to investigate? Also, uh, you don't want Bob uh, to, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, you want to be sure about Bob, but you don't want, want to be caught snooping. So you don't want to like, uh, you know, investigate too many situations. So which situations do you need to investigate uh, without investigating too many? And if you work that through, Bob borrows my car, he fills up the gas tank. Which situations do you need to check out? And again, we want to check out if he borrowed the car. Of course, if he borrowed the car, you're going to check to see if the uh, gas gauge is back up to full. Uh, if he didn't borrow the car, you don't really care if he put gas in it or not. If he, you know, if he did, that would be great. Uh, if you get into your car and the tank is full, you don't care if he used it or not. However, let's say that the tank is below full, you want to know whether or not he drove the car or not, because if he drove it, and the tank gauge is not on full, you'll know that he's breaking your agreement. And when you phrase this as an agreement, you get 75% correct. People are able to get this correct 75% of the time. But as you can see, it's the same exact, same exact problem. So why is it in one case, the hypothetical you know, D you know, is 7 uh, situation, only 25% of the people get it correct, and a familiar social contract, or even an unfamiliar social contract, 75% get it right. And the answer is that this is probably a very, very complex fixed action pattern. Remember I said that, uh, you know, these uh, mental modules develop because of evolutionary problems that we face. Well, during the last you know, several million years of human history, we've made agreements with other humans. And the agreements are we give up something, but then they give us something in return. And if we're not good at making sure people follow those agreements, we could end up being cheated out of stuff. And a thousand years ago, if you're cheated out of some food, you may starve and die. And so those stupid genes are not going to go into the next generation. Uh, so uh, we've had a lot of time in our evolutionary history uh, to really develop uh, you know, a very, very complex uh, you know, mental module such as our ability to spot cheaters. And uh, that's it for the lecture. But one thing I want to, in, in about five minutes, mention, uh, talking a lot about evolution. Uh, so uh, 
just want to cover the basics because a lot of people don't know the basics. Uh, that's really too bad, especially about human uh, evolution. Uh, so here are the last two million years of human evolution. Uh, our ancestors, uh, Homo agaster, were right here. Uh, Homo erectus, they pretty much look the same. Uh, Homo ancestor, right there. Uh, Homo rodensiensis, right there. Homo neanderthal, right there. And as we can see, here we are up here, the Homo sapiens and we can trace our evolutionary history through Erdensius and Ancestor and Ergasta, Ergaster. So during this two million year run, anything that Homo Ergaster learned about living together with other humans or working with other humans, that went into our genetic makeup, our genetic package that we carried along and anything they learned here was carried along and anything that the uh, Neanderthals learned was carried along and indeed there was some overlap here especially if you have European roots uh, that is white people Caucasians uh, Neanderthals uh, you know uh, interbred with uh, Homo sapiens in Europe, and so therefore some of the uh, genetic material of Neanderthals mixed with uh, present-day uh, European, uh, you know, human beings. So anything learned during these two million, two million years about living together, uh, you know, as human beings, uh, that uh, you know is. Uh, you know, available to us in terms of fixed action patterns. I have a couple markers here. Around here is when human beings developed fire, and around here is when Homo sapiens started to talk. And in fact, uh, evolutionary biologists and evolutionary psychologists think that a lot of what we have in terms of fixed action patterns, like when did the Wason task really develop? During these last half million years since the development of fire. Uh, this was also the period where uh, we became hunter-gatherers uh, and we started to uh, you know, you know, segue uh, into uh, agriculture and uh, you know, leaving behind hunter and gathering. Uh, and so uh, during this time period uh, we feel that this is when a lot of these fixed action patterns that are very complex, like the waste and task, developed. Uh, but, uh, you know, another thing about, you know, this chart, let me clear it. There we go. Uh, is that, <coughs> excuse me. Eh, no, I'm, it's, this is, lecture is getting too long. I won't go into that. And uh, one final thing, whoops, I wanted to mention. I've actually had students ask me about this. Uh, they said, well, you know, uh, if we evolve from uh, Homo agaster here, why isn't he around? What happened to him? Uh, and, uh, you know, another point I'd like to make out is a lot of people, you know, a lot of evolutionary psychologists point out that if you take one of these guys or gals and you clean them up and give them a shave and a haircut and put them in a suit and put them on the street in Manhattan, you really may not look at them twice. Uh, and there's really not that much of a difference between us, these different humans. And uh, you know, uh, we can you know we can talk about the different hominids. That is, people talk about you know, the surviving apes, and we're one of the five uh, hominid species that are left. And again, students also tell me, well, if we evolve from chimpanzees, uh, why are there still chimpanzees here since we evolved from them? We understand that if we evolve from this guy here, he's gone, but why are chimpanzees still here if we evolve from them? 
And just to clarify that, this is our family tree and our descent. Uh, and so uh, we descended from species that were around uh, 16 million years ago. And around 16 million years ago, uh, we uh, went one direction and the gorillas went another direction. And then about three million years ago, chimpanzees went one direction and human beings went the other direction. And so, you know, when we talk about, well, why are, you know, chimpanzees still here if we evolve from them? We never evolve from chimpanzees. We evolve from a common ancestor with the chimpanzees three million years ago. And why are there gorillas if, uh, you know, we evolve from gorillas? Well, we didn't evolve from gorillas. Gorillas and us evolved from the species that was around 15 million years ago. For example, our last common ancestor with the chimpanzee was this guy here. He lived about 6 million years ago, uh, Sal Anthropus uh, Shadentus. And the last common ancestor that we had with the great apes, that is gorillas and orangutans, was about 13 million years ago. Uh, and that was her, uh, Pyrolapithensius catalanicus. And uh, that's what we know her by. That is the partial skull that led anthropologists to be able to develop a composite of what she must have looked like. Okay, so that's something I always want to uh, you know, clear up. Uh, and that's it for today. So hopefully uh, in class you should have some questions about the lecture. Uh, hopefully you take notes and go over your notes before our uh, lecture class uh, so that you could ask questions and uh, we can talk about this lecture. All right, thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.